All right, thank you for everyone uh, tuning in live and, and those watching uh, remotely on the on the recording. Um, so today we've got the first session of our Better Debt uh, webinar series um, and joining us is uh, Kristen, Tim and, and myself and I'll get everyone to introduce themselves in a second as we go through. A um, little bit of background and, and a bit of context setting for everybody. So we've got 45 minutes today, uh, 10 minutes of which will be a bit of an introduction for myself um, and introduction from the speakers. Uh, and then we'll be then passing across to Tim for 10 minutes on the current state of the industry, across to Kristen on what's possible, uh, and then myself covering off demystifying um, sort of how AI can be used, particularly within the context of, of our business and, and industry. Um, and we'll keep this fairly open and conversational between the speakers uh, as we as we move through. But uh, Kristen, I'll pass across to you for a quick intro from yourself. Sure. Kristen Leffler. Um, I'm the Vice President of Digital Strategy and Operations at Resurgent Capital Services. So primarily debt collector, um, master servicer for a debt buyer. So that's kind of my industry background. Uh, I've been here for 11 years, um, focused primarily on analytic um, exercises from portfolio segmentation, some legal non-performing judgment strategies, and then pivoted to help build um, our digital capabilities back in 2018. So since then, I've been focused on the customer experience and collections, how we can improve that, um, and managing all of our digital channels to try to create an omni-channel experience. So that's really been my focus for the past few years. I'm passionate about making um, a better experience for our customers and collections, and I'm excited uh, to join you guys to talk about this topic today. So thanks for having me. Tim. Thanks, for thanks Chris. Tim, what's to you? Yeah, excited to be here, Chris. And, you know, great having you uh, on board with us today, yeah, especially as our first guest. And uh, Tim Collins, Chief Compliance Officer and General Counsel here at Indebted. And uh, been this year will be my 30th year in the industry. And I've been focused on technology from the very beginning when I saw this industry was using index cards. Uh, for those who don't know what that's are, it's a paper product. It's about three by five. <laughs> and that's how people worked accounts in the old days and um, have been focused on AI over, over the last um, uh, five and a half years now and the, what, what it can do in this space. I've seen everything from the regulatory uh, changes that we saw 2008, 2009 in the United States. And uh, my, my main focus in the last coming up on three years has been with Indebted, um, expanding our global reach into um, really changing the way customers are interacted with as it relates to their debt. So super excited to, to be here with everybody today talking about what we see is happening and what's what's coming and how you can best prepare for that. Awesome, thanks, Tim. Uh, and just a quick introduction uh, from myself. I'm Josh, the founder and CEO of Indebted. And um, hopefully you know who we are uh, jumping on this webinar. But as Tim mentioned, we're a global collections business with operations in the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the UK. Um, and, a, and a big part of the R&D work that's happening in our team at the moment centers around AI uh, and various use cases. And so I think it's it's very relevant um, to, to what we're going to jump through today. And so uh, looking forward to it. Quick little bit of housekeeping uh, for any everybody. So uh, you'll notice on the right-hand side of your screen, there is there's the chat um, Q&A section. Um, if you, if you want to ask questions, um, the chat will work, but we'll, we'll be monitoring the Q&A side. So if you can please click on Q&A um, and let, uh, put, push any of your questions there. Um, and Emma behind the scenes will help moderate that. And we'll make sure we answer and go through your questions. Um, at the end, uh, in the 15 minutes, we have a lot of the Q&A side of things. If you seem to be having any issues with audio or video, um, there is a light mode that you can toggle onto. Um, so please feel free to use that. And if you have to jump off or if there's any interruption on your end, um, please don't stress the recording will be sent to you uh, in your email after the event. But that's all the housekeeping side of things. Um, and I've gone through the agenda before. Uh, here's a quick recap for everyone on the screen. Um, but Tim, we're going to be kicking off bit your side. Yeah, thanks, Josh. I thought uh, we'd start out with really the the current state of the debt collection industry in itself, and um, it's it's amazing to be working at Indebted because you get this global perspective. And there's some differences by geographics, but there's a lot a lot of similarities that we're that we're seeing. Three main things that I want to talk about today are really around the economics, the regulatory, and then touch on uh, the techno 
technological because that will feed into uh, the rest of the presentation that we're that we're doing. From an economic perspective, well, I think from a whole industry perspective, I was trying to figure out one word that we could use that would sum everything up. And the best word I could come up with was an F word and it's flux. Uh, <laughs> everything is in flux. And um, I know people were thinking other words, uh, depending upon where you are in, in, your, in the technological journey or client <laughs> journey, but um, flux is the word, uh, mainly because we're seeing so many changes happen in such a rapid period of time. Um, and whether that's economic, which I'll start with first, we're still seeing this, you know, we saw this pandemic with the, the COVID funds and a lot of uh, economies were injected with money and savings went up and debt went down. And that's completely pivoted now. We've, we've seen an economy where the debt is probably at a high uh, um, all-time high for so many um, uh, countries around the world. Savings is at an uh, all-time low. In the United States, I think we've cracked a trillion dollars in credit card debt. Savings is below uh, below 200 billion now. So when you think about that for 360, you know, 65 million people in the United States, that's that's a pretty pretty scary number. Similar stuff that's going around with inflation. You know, we've seen the interest rates. Everybody's increasing the interest rates as the cost of living and and, and went up. That led into salary increases, which really drove staffing concerns. There was already some staffing post-pandemic uh, concerns. And now it's like in order to get people to come on board, you have to be able to pay them more, better benefits and those kind of things, which just, you know, kind of fed back into that. In the United States, we've seen, a, you know, the, the interest rates at least haven't risen and, and most other countries around the world have, have, have followed that. They've seemed to think that we've got inflation under control. Uh, but the debt is really what's the most concerning. So from a from a debt collection perspective, that could be good news because there's a lot of product that's coming. Um, that's not good news if you don't have the staffing to go with it. Uh, but if customers can't pay the debt, then we're it doesn't really matter. Uh, then you're right back to okay, what are we? How's this all going to flow out? And so I want to talk just briefly about that because everybody's looking for these tipping points and. In the United States, and I'm going to kick this over to you, Kristen. Here in the United States, everybody, the the we we we've, we've had a stay on student loan payments, and and and, and education is required to be paid for. There's no universal health, uh, universal um, education, or it's very very expensive to go to school in the United States uh, at uni university, you know, college, uni for everybody else. Uh, so, student loans are already have been been stayed. That's now. Payments are supposed to start on the 28th. Everybody thinks that's going to be, excuse me, the end of September, around the 28th. Everybody thinks that's going to be this tipping point for the United States economy. And I know that, Kristen, you had gone to a conference where people, um, the folks had talked through where that's probably not the end of September that people are going to start that. We'll see this massive tipping point and, and, and things will fall apart. But it, it's, a, it's a different time frame. And if you could talk about that quickly, that maybe help, with, help the audience understand tipping points and and what to expect yeah. in the U.S. economy. Sure. So I, I also thought, you know, student loan interest was starting to accrue again as of the 1st of September. So then payments are going to come due kind of like the 1st of October, and then everybody's going to have this giant payment shock, right? So, um, and this is, this is public. TransUnion put out a study. You can get to it on their website saying, hey, we don't expect anything to happen to customers' credit scores as a result, which was confusing for me. I was like, well, that's kind of crazy, right? Um, I did not appreciate that as part of the new um, student loan forgiveness plan that was rolled out by the current administration, not the one that got struck down, but the new one, um, there's some provisions around income-based repayment, but there's also a provision that says, um, delinquencies cannot be reported for a year. So even if a customer, mm -hmm. you know, is required to make a payment, their interest is accruing, those delinquencies are not going to be reported to the credit bureaus for a whole nother year. So though customers are supposed to be making payments and they are encouraged to make payments if they can, there will be no real negative impact to their scores. So no, um, you know, strong incentive to make payments until those delinquencies begin to be reported all the way in January of 25. So student loan delinquencies are already not reported until the 90 day past due bucket. They're not reported in the traditional 30 days and 60 days past due buckets like we see in other consumer receivables. Um, they don't get reported for 90 days and then there's a year 
pause on that, every delinquency effectively gets reset, the clock gets reset. So the, the oncoming shock that we've kind of been expecting to see, it seems like it keeps getting pushed out. Of course, we won't really know until we hit that October 1st date or during the month of October to see what happens. But um, I thought that was interesting that I didn't really appreciate that sort of footnote in the Department of Education's bulletin. Yeah, that's, that's, I'm sure some people will start paying, obviously, and sure. some, you know, but really the, the hammer's not there as it relates to, um, hey, you've got to do it. Otherwise, it's going to start to impact your, your credit score and stuff. I know, Josh, in, the, in Australia, where I'm, I'm currently trying to reside as much as I possibly can, <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a similar uh, tipping point, but use, uh, around mortgages. If you could talk through that uh, just a little bit, that'd be great. Yeah, definitely. So I think one of the things um, in the US that, that's quite different than some of the other markets we operate in um, is your approach to particularly 30 year fixed mortgages. And so obviously everyone's enjoyed a, a pretty awesome period over the last few years where you've been able to lock in, you know, potentially as low as 1.9, 1.8% um, mortgages and, and lock them in for 30 years, which drives a very different housing dynamic than to what we see in some other markets like Australia. Um, but in Australia, that's that's not the case. Um, you know, a lot of people, the majority on three and five year fixed mortgages are or on variable already and have been riding the rate rises um, over the last couple of quarters. Um, but we have, you know, a large portion, if not the majority of Australians with mortgages rolling from their fixed rates onto either variables or into new fixed rates, which are materially different than what they were before. Um, with, I think most people seeing, you know, substantial, if not as, as high as sort of doubling of their mortgage repayments. And so I think that that acts somewhat similar as, as this cliff that you mentioned in the US with student loan repayments in the sense that, you know, we have, there will be a lot less disposable income. And I think that's certainly what a lot of the Australian banks and Australian lenders have a, a keen focus on is, is understanding, okay, what is that going to do in terms of the payment ca you know, capability um, of the consumer? And how is that money then going to get either a dictated and spent, which is going to have some economic impact, or is there enough money there to meet those repayments and then how does that cascade into other items like car loans and others as well? And so I think we have, as you said, the similar dynamic from a different sort of asset class um, with the same macro backdrop, which is depleting savings balances that we saw rise during COVID um, and increasing unsecured debt, um, not to the tune of 1.1 trillion, like in the US, obviously a smaller population, <laughs> but still nonetheless, a um, you know big numbers that people need to be concerned about that overlays, I think, to the context setting, which you're pointing to, which is this idea of how, you know, with increased volumes of consumers entering delinquency, how do we manage that volume? And I think that, you know, hopefully, whilst we don't expect things to be nearly anywhere near what we saw in, in 08 during the GFC, you know, there was a huge issue, particularly in the US at that period of time, which was there wasn't enough collectors, right, to, to man the phones right. and, and be able to, to manage that volume of accounts entering delinquency. Now we're in a very different world, a world with a lot of digital collections, um, something that everyone on this call knows well about and spends a lot of time in. But we also have a, a new frontier of, of stuff with AI that I think can help enable that to make sure we can balance volume with consumer outcomes as well. Yeah, and I think, Josh, you make a great point about the, the economics between those two timeframes. You know, at least in the United States, a lot of government money went into the economy and so there was a lot of money to collect and i think there's it's going to be interesting to see this time if there's if there's what kind of bailout if any uh would happen as you start to see this i mean interest rates are interest rates it's being done for a purpose which is to kind of cool down the economy as it relates to inflation but i do see uh, probably even more you know accounts coming in just because of the debt the inability to service them you know and and the the technology that would be required. I don't think we can staff, you, I don't think you can staff your way out of the problem that's potentially coming. You just can't probably hire fast enough. And then from an economics perspective, it doesn't make, doesn't make sense. Um, a lot of, a lot of agencies are struggling with profitability right now as, as mm. costs go up from a compliance perspective, which is really driven by that regulation and then the wages to be able to pay people. So from, you know, the regulatory perspective, you know, we're seeing regulation all around the world um, there's new financial products that are coming out really the buy now pay later space has seen a, a tremendous amount of interest because of the, the the very fast growth that you can possibly that 
that that we've seen in this space and we were we were talking beforehand and and Kristen was talking about that you can now pay for your for your for your meal in four in four payments and it's just when you start to think about okay we never would have done that before for a, a, i think we said 20 dollar pizza or something now mm -hmm. it's like okay it's four it's four payments for everything and i don't know if they have the regulators are going to be too excited about that piece um, because so much of that, especially in the United States, is not covered by regulation because it's done in four payments. Actually, it's done in three because you make your first payment, then you have three other payments due. So a lot of the regulatory oversight wasn't built for those kind of products. And so whether it's the FCA in um, the UK, huge interest, they're, they're in CFPB in the United States is, is all over it from a... They want access to the data and you know get it reported so we can truly understand how much exposure um, customers are having so regulatory um is is all of a sudden very much awake everywhere because of these new products and there's new products that are coming out all the time and now you have some companies like apple that are involved in the finance piece of, of four pay and they're you know they got you know billions and billions in cash sitting around as they try to figure out what's the best product for for their customers and they've got the, the backing to be able to do it from a funding perspective. Last piece we'll talk about is just the technological changes that we're seeing. You know, the the globally, interestingly enough, digitalization has been around much, much longer than it has been in the United States. Text messaging is widely accepted, widely accepted, not wildly, but wide, <laughs> widely accepted. Maybe both. And yes, <laughs> it's, <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit of both. Um, email has been around for a very, very long time. And so the digitalization is way more mature in, in, in other markets, um, which is interesting that from that perspective, coming from the U.S. perspective, just because we are we've seen, you know, SMS really be, you know, become the next big collection tool from a channel perspective. And then a lot of agencies lost that capability because the the carriers here were trying to prevent fraud and, and, and kind of overstepped, I think, in some areas. And, and a lot of agencies lost that capability. Uh, some are now looking more towards email, which, um, you know, customers start with email. And um, that's been used for the whole financial transaction itself. But um, so it's interesting from the, from a maturity perspective that it's all this, you know, what channel are you going to customers with? And what we're seeing now is sort of the, you know, have your dialer manager, you've got an email manager and you've got an SMS manager and you're running your queries to figure out what accounts get what, what account, yeah, what accounts get what and when was the last time it was emailed. And then you layer on something like we do here at Indebted where it's really more about intelligence, you know, right channel, right time, right communication. And we'll, we'll talk more about that as we go, go through that piece. But the, the, the digitalization and technology push is driving a lot of changes inside of our industry in, in, in the United States alone because there's, there hasn't been this wide push into digitalization before. It's been a call letter, uh, as antiquated as that sounds, for some of our listeners who are in, in, you know, around the world. It is, that's been predominantly the way the collections has been done. And um, unique calls. You got to have that capability. You need letters in some jurisdictions. You have to have that capability, but it can't be the number one way that you're that you're collecting in the future. So, this digitalization, intelligent collection is, um, and you and you throw on top of that the chat, you know, chat GBT, AI. It's it's one of the reasons that indebted is we've decided that it, that's you know we're we're a tech company to begin with anyway, but it's that's really where the change is, is going to happen. And that's where our whole, we're driving our whole culture around that piece. Um, and so that's, it's super exciting because the change is happening so quickly, uh, but it can be very terrifying if you're on the other side of it and just like, okay, what was, what was acceptable, you know, last year, predictive dialers is now, you know, well, it's predictive SMS and it's next level stuff uh, to begin with. So it's, it's definitely the the F word here uh, in flux. And so um, that's what we're seeing. But it's a great opportunity for those that are well positioned that are looking ahead and embracing the technology and preparing for what's coming. Um, so that's the exciting piece for me because we've seen changes before. We've been through 2008. There were there were crises before that. There'll be crises after this. And, and anytime you see those you know, significant changes in a short period of time, it's opportunity. So 
very optimistic. I think the pace. I think the pace this time will be different. I mean, that's my ta- that's my mm, take, right? right? I think the pace of change that AI can bring to every aspect of the collection shop is different and more radical than what we saw when, you know, predictive dialers came online or when outsourced litter shops did X Y Z, right? I think, I maybe I'm just uh, scared, but <laughs> I think it will be different this time. I think yeah, the speed of technology. Like, yeah, I think the speed of change right now is just phenomenal. I mean, we saw even in the the AI models that are coming out from a Chat GPT perspective, and now the plugins that they're putting in. And you know, as we were talking about before, people were like, "I need to become a really good prompter." No, because now there's a plugin you can put in there that will help you prompt the best prompt to get the best response that you can possibly get. And six months ago, that didn't exist. You know, um, the, the, the open AI has been around th- since 2018, but you look at what's happened in the last year, mm-hmm. just as it's come out, that that speed of change is going to be the, the, the piece that not that I was there for this, but it kind of makes me think about in history, like when you went from, you know, oil based lighting to electricity, right. But it's still, you had all to do all this infrastructure to get that infrastructure to make electricity have a huge impact. You don't, the infrastructure has already been built. It's already there. It's, yeah, it's already there. Mm-hmm. It's just like go over. It's like one day you walk into your house and there's a light switch that's there. And yesterday it wasn't there. And so it's like, it's that fast from a technological perspective. And you think about it, okay, what else is going to come off of that? You know, radio, TV, in every house, um, AI in everything you do. And that's our, that's mm-hmm. our, our cultural drive right now. So it's, it's pretty exciting. Yeah, absolutely. And I think just one of the key points, Tim, that you sort of highlighted there, um, touching across a few different things and, you know, using the example of, you know, paying in full for a pizza. I think there's there's another element to this, which is obviously the consumer preferences have changed by virtue of the products they're mm-hmm. using. So mm-hmm. if we'd gone back two years, five years, whatever, you most likely would have paid for that pizza on a credit card, right? So mm-hmm. it's, it's a form of potentially credit and on how you look at it. Um, but has a very different structure in terms of how it's engaged with, you know, pr- pr- results in a revolving balance that then obviously engages with the consumer. They most likely signed up for that product 10 years ago in a branch. They have predominantly phone as their primary contact method. And now in that example used there, the consumer has no face-to-face or voice engagement with the finance product behind the scenes. It's entirely driven over email, text, or web chat. And as those consumers go through into, you know, potentially difficult times, looking at the macro backdrop that you set, the way that they're going to want to engage with everybody that is potentially in that credit stack is going to be different. And I think that's something that's going to be very different from how we've seen things in the past in that it's not just about staffing, as you said, it's also sitting there with respects to how um, the actual consumers are going to want to engage with the creditors and in in some cases, unfortunately, the collection agencies as well um, that need to engage with them. But I think that's a, that's a good segue into uh, Kristen's section to, to jump into some of the stuff on sort of how, um, yeah, what's possible on the AI front and and take in from there. Yeah, sure. So um, in my, in my role, I get to talk to lots of different companies. I'm not, I'm not going to, mention anybody's names as I'm not shilling for specific companies, but I get to see lots of products that are touching AI. Um, So I I feel like I have a pretty good sense of what is available in the marketplace for everybody on this call. Hey, did you know this is a product that exists? This is a product that exists. I, I wanted to focus a little bit of time on what is already possible? Because if your role isn't an innovative role, and if you're not constantly out looking for that, you might not even know this is already existing. And then, and then after I, I chat for a little bit, we'll pass it off to Josh. We'll be like, and then you didn't even know about this, but guess what we're doing over here? <laughs> so um, <laughs> a, a few different uh, products that already exist. Um, it is already possible for you to use AI created content and then have just a human in the loop. Whether that response is coming back to you, you the collector through email, chatbot, SMS, um, probably even on the analog like paper front, though I don't particularly know of of an app that will do that for you. If you have emails coming in, chats coming in, it is already possible to let an AI create a response and then just have a human read it over to make sure that there's no 
hallucinations, no problems in that text. That's been around for actually quite a while, um, but now ChatGPT and the other LLM models are very, very, very good at creating responses that are as good and as compliant as what you would have an agent do. Um, we call those human in the loop because there is a human who has the final say in pressing the send button. Um, those models can be trained on a, a corpus of your own correspondence, on your own PMPs, um, and then as the humans say approve, no, approve, no, edit, then the model learns what is and isn't correct so it continues to get better over time. So that is, you know, one product that already exists, plugs into collection systems that already exist. Um, and if you're not using a, a product like that, that is one way to forestall what Tim is mentioning about your margin pressures from increased staffing because allowing an AI to assist your agents makes each agent themselves more productive and probably in improves overall job satisfaction, reduces the amount of repetitive tasks, um, and, and they become like a, a higher level thinker rather than just, you know, cutting and pasting something out of your reference guide. Um, there's already also at least one open AI specifically based collection system. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of other ones that are leveraging LLMs or large language models within the organization. These types of products can be deployed on a small scale to limit risk. You know, over here, only this group is allowed to use it. You can create a champion challenger in the organization to decide, is it working, is it not working? Um, and, and you can train that internally. So that's sort of the, the agent workforce response piece that already exists and has existed for years now. Um, on the voice side, there are also IVRs that are inbound voice recognition. So many of us will be familiar with an IVR. It's like press one for this, press two for this, press one for Spanish, press two for English, whatever whatever the case is, right? Those are you know input-based. Um, but if you call your bank, likely you are not having that experience. Your bank knows what phone number you called in from, stored and recognized your voice print, um, knows who you are, knows that you're Tim, you're the right guy. I can talk to you. I can disclose this information. So those products also already exist, not only to recognize who you're speaking with, but to recognize what the customer is saying, the tone of voice, the sentiment, the purpose of the call, um, and then either route the call appropriately or increasingly have the AI actually do the response. And if you, if you think about just how much analytic power is going into that, so I'm speaking, there's an AI here translating the words as an audio file into text, running it through a different model, trying to figure out what's happening in there, spitting it back out with a text response, and then translating that back into a voice. And it's all so fast, it's imperceptible to the human, which is an insane amount of com compute power. Um, and that is now available as an off-the-shelf product, which would take years and years and years and years, um, you know, even just five or 10 years ago would have taken years of R&D to develop, and now that's an off-the-shelf product. Um, so you can leapfrog other people's you know, learning and R&D and technology and gain access to something like that. Uh, I do want to point out, and Tim, jump in if you disagree, I think, there's, I think there's more risk in that kind of a model because there's multiple steps involved, right? Multiple places for it to go wrong. And there's not really a human in the loop because it's, it's not an async channel. When you're email, you can like, AI is responding, human can look at it and say yes, no. When it's a live voice, there's there's more risk there. I don't know if you would disagree with that. No, I absolutely agree because it's just the, um, you know, that overview yet, and it's really understanding that the limitations of, you know, that AI and it still needs to have some of that, that human piece in there. I, I do think the better your data that you have, the better the response is, that kind of stuff that you still uh, want to. But even when it gets to some point where you're feeling it's like 95% confidence, you know, that it's going to say the right thing and it's, it's it can't say the inappropriate thing that you can think of, you still have to have an audit program that's in place that's just going to come in and still queue. I mean, you're going to have automated QA, um, you know, QAing automated calls <laughs> and then then you're gonna have, you still have to have both systems looked at to make sure that there's something that that's not going it's it's not going amiss. So maybe 
then you have a QA that's automated for the QA that's on top of the QA. Um, so it never, it, it could never end uh, a part of that piece. And we've seen from a regulatory perspective, the CFPD is very, very concerned in the United States about something I think you've talked about in the past, Kristen, which is the dark patterns. And you mm -hmm. can easily put people into loops, which they cannot get out of uh, because you don't want them to get out of it. And so not that anybody would do that intentionally. There's something you could build in that, you know, you just like, you have to test the whole thing all the time to make sure that it, that it's working the way that it's supposed to. And so I like, I like to be able to look at the, the, the verbal as it's come in and me even analyzing stuff that's going on in an automated QA perspective, it's taken the verbal translated it, uh, transcribed it, I should say. And, and you still have to go listen to the, you have to go listen to it. You just can't read it. Mm -hmm. So it's a great point. Some, something else I think I've heard you say in the past too is that, you know, agency owners should go ahead and call their collection center every now and then. And the same is true when you have an AI system, make, make sure you don't get trapped in a loop. It's not, it's not perfect. You're not always going to find the problems doing single unit tests, but you should be aware of what your customer experience is. And, you know, I think to Josh's point, the customers today are the same customers who are shopping on Amazon and they have one click payments and they're the same customers who are paying for their pizza and four, those same customers are the customers that you are trying to collect from. So if they go from this amazing customer experience to a terrible customer experience, there's already a disincentive to pay, right? These customers are already behind on their payments. It's uncomfortable. We should make it as easy as possible and use the experiences that they're used to to help ease mm -hmm. that transition into the collections process. Agreed, agreed. Um, an and another- just, Tristan, a quick yeah, question. How, how, do you, how do you think about innovating like with it, with respects to AI within that this sort of environment, obviously one that's heavily regulated, heavily litigious, particularly in markets like the US, how do you balance that ability to innovate given that I think there are more of these vectors where things can go wrong? Like when you test out SMS, for example, mm -hmm. as you said, you're curating and making sure the content's correct. You're managing the timing and delivery and, and some of those other elements. You don't, you've never had to worry about the SMS hallucinating and just putting random mm -hmm. text in for a customer. <laughs> So how, how do you think about balancing that and then also overlapping that with like how you manage your organization structure to to enable both of those things to sort of work together you know harmoniously great great questions i think uh, my my favorite way to deploy any sort of innovation is to try it in a sandbox environment or a tightly controlled test ideally you're able to actually create a separate test environment so you can have real data running in a test environment where there is no risk of actually communicating directly with the customer but you do have real customer data input so you can watch it and automate QA then once you feel comfortable with that you can kind of deploy it and prod again though in a subset um, watching it making sure that you can watch not only you know, customer responses, but you have feedback loops in place coming from your legal department to see, are we receiving any litigation? What are we seeing on the CFPB complaint portal? What are we seeing in customer disputes? Positive, like, hey, is it making us more money? But also contained um, experimentation and that you gradually scale up once you once you see something's working and it's compliant, then you can double down on it. That's kind of my, my baseline, how I deploy new innovations. Um, and then I think, one problem in our industry that I've experienced in my time has just been we fail to look outside our industry for our ideas and innovations. And I think um, mm. there is a ton of information and a ton of super interesting um, possibilities on what what new and innovative technologies exist outside of our industry. So all the tech companies are regularly publishing like academic studies on, hey, we created this algorithm that does X, Y, Z. All of that is published and available. So if you have a way to stick it in ChatGPT and say, hey, summarize this paper for me. Could it be used in collections? Like that's one way that is, is a great way to identify possible innovations um, that then you can put into because that's sort of a controlled sandbox environment. Um, you should always have, of course, you should always have your legal and compliance teams know what you're up to um so that they can <laughs> they will be thinking of things that you may not have the perspective on so i don't advocate like i'm just going to go over here and have chat gpt do my job i'm a collector and i'm just going to have it do my job i don't advocate for that because you do need to have some controls um yeah and then go ahead go ahead no, i think no, the next question is like org structure right 
Yeah. 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 Okay. So I, we, we started to touch a little bit on this and we talked about, hey, here are some of these tools that can be used to augment the workforce. Um, there's another tool that you can use to actually train your collectors on escalations and create customized training plans. It's an AI that will interact with them and start to act like an annoyed customer. I think those ways are ways or um, another one that does live call scoring and notations. So that's like the bane of every collection manager's existence, right? Is all this non-value add work. Now you can augment the cut, the rep experience with these tools. So that means you need potentially fewer reps, but the rep job changes. They have more inbound calls instead of outbound calls. They have more pleasant interactions. They have more customer service type calls where you're trying to problem solve for the customer. So I think the type of people that you recruit for those jobs is different. Um, the type of people who have to respond to emails are also, you need to be like fluent in potentially multiple languages or capable of using tools to translate into multiple languages. Um, I think you need, you also end up outsourcing more of your intelligence into some vendors. So what does that mean from a data security? What does that mean from vendor oversight? What does that mean from your client restrictions? I think you end up having to build up a little bit more in those teams, as well as, you know, analysts and engineers. Most collection agencies don't have like a stable of analysts and engineers at their disposal to make these changes. So th your org structure ends up shifting to those types of jobs. I don't ever think that the rep job goes away. I think it changes. And I think the balance of workforce in your organization changes, um, which does impact margin. So that's, you know, each incremental send cost goes down. An email is cheaper than a letter, but now you have a higher fixed cost in your people. Yeah, so, absolutely so great. There. Yeah, absolutely great. I think we're going to see this, you know, collectors were very good verbally. That skill set just has to change to so many other things that they're going to be doing, training the machine, all that kind of stuff. It becomes a, it becomes a different job inside of itself. So, but a lot of exciting stuff that's happening in that front. Um, Josh, if, if, if you were, you know, building something, oh, hold on, you are, um, <laughs> you know, what would some of those things, uh, some of those things look like. That'd be great to be able to show our, our audience. Awesome, sorry, I'm, apologies for the uh, the cut out of the internet. I'm actually gonna quickly jump over to my hotspot because uh, the Airbnb Wi-Fi is uh, giving me some issues here. So Tim, if you want to me for one second, I'm just gonna jump across. Yep, yep absolutely. I think that the, you know, that Kristen, what you were talking about, there's AI in every single thing that we do now. And that's the uh, the amazing piece. Whether it's training collectors, listening to calls, you know, responding to consumers, there's no area inside of the business that can't be used. And to your point, it's like it's being open to what those possibilities are based upon your experiences that you're seeing. You know, as you interact with the world, like I had mm -hmm. to change my flight with United. I couldn't do it online. It was um, just because it was too close to the flight. So it ended up being a phone call. It, it, it already knew who I was, you know, you know, it, it, it made the That's change perfect. and it's, it's ever evolving as quickly as possible. I think that speaks to yeah, one of these questions absolutely. that came in in the, in the Q and A about does, does better self-service or more intelligent digital channels send the more complicated cases to a human? And, and my, my take there is, Yes, I think that changes it, it changes the job of what a representative must be able to handle from outbound collection call, here's my script, to complicated um, cases. Yeah, and I agree, but I think the, the AI is there to help them. So the AI can, it's almost like you're making all of your agents exactly. bionic because now the AI can go out and say, yeah, here's you know this complex issue. Um, they've asked for a human or it needs to go to a human but here's what we think the response should be. Mm -hmm. And then the human interacts and says, so they don't have to go look it up in a learning management system. They can go find it. It can be presented to them in real time. That's, it's, that's a yeah. great example where I think uh, every collection manager is trying to like create their reference materials, right? Or their learning management system, but it's hard to plan for every edge case and the AI is there to support those edge cases. You don't yeah. have to code that up in your LMS. You're like, oh, I see this 
you know, this is this particular thing. Here's how you can handle that. It's a great point. Yeah, exactly. And I think that is the opportunity with AI, right, is, and particularly with these LLMs, is the ability to be able to manage these complex cases. Like, I look at that as the the big opportunity whereby sort of you know, automated sort of IVR type of responses or canned responses on a chat don't give you the ability to manage those complex um, queries as well. And so I think they there's an opportunity, whether it goes through calling or whether it goes through a digital channel, I think what the AI opportunity really represents is to be able to manage these more complex edge cases that you can't really do with rudimentary sort of canned responses. And then that opens up a whole vector of things that would typically need a huge that we don't necessarily need anymore. Um, and so I think that's happening. Awesome. I'll jump a little bit into a couple of things um, happening on uh, on our side of things here. So the I think we spoke a little bit about with respect to um, some of the voice AI stuff. And, and I think we're taking a step back for everybody where I look at the world of digital collections and where that sort of overlaps with more of the sort of analog approach and let's use calling as an example, is that we've always had this debate of where does digital work and where do you need to still use calling and, and voice sort of based collections. And I think that the opportunity with respect to AI allows us to blend that a little, a little bit more. And typically when I look at it, it sort of goes to the question that was in the Q&A side, which is it's more complex cases. Now, whether that's more complex inbound situations like a dispute or something like that, I think it, it also more deals with complex outbound cases as well, right? So you're calling a consumer who's in a more difficult position across multiple products, potentially the balances are higher, the structuring of that outcome needs to be a little bit more complex than could be easily sort of outlaid in an email or in a portal that's really where we certainly on the R and D side is looking for the opportunity to to deploy that. Um, and then, you know, Kristen, you touched on this with respect to some of the tools that you're seeing, but the ability to do that compute so quickly that we can really get voice down to this indistinguishable difference. And when I think we're pretty close, we're like 10, 15 milliseconds away from being able to really make it almost un, unidentifiable that you are having a conversation with essentially a piece of AI, a computer on the other end is, is pretty fascinating. But if, if I look at those two opportunities, that's really what I think we can start to push forward. So some of the things that we've experimented with on the indebted side, one has been outbound AI voice. And we're starting to really, the way we looked at it is let's look at use cases that, you know, we, we all talked earlier on about sort of the ROI and the profit margins. Where are the use cases where it has been harder to justify expensive outbound, you know, agent-based um, and particularly voice-based engagement on either a certain type of population of consumers or, you know, those things that always used to sit in the nice to have buckets. And one of those was certainly around payment arrangements for us and our, our payer book. And so actively engaging with payers to whether it's to make sure that those are the right structures for them, whether it is to re-engage them for people who have fallen off. And so we've recently had a really successful um, test with that, with engaging that outbound payer base via outbound AI voice. And I think, you know, the team will share this on LinkedIn, but we saw $750,000 of payments within the first week. And so it shows that there is a clear aptitude towards the consumer to engage this way. Um, but also that that's a use case that internally was very hard to justify before. Um, and, you know, when we look at the sort of the ROI on that internally, we, we see sort of like a, a 20x um, which is, is phenomenal in terms of justifying some of, some of that work. Um, but the real, the real thing that we see as the opportunity is replicating what the best collectors can do with AI. And I think, you know, Tim, you, you touched on this a second ago with respects to it, it's about assisting the agents, it's about assisting the human. I think that's a big part of what AI is going to be able to enable us to do, um, particularly over the next sort of couple of months. But it's not to replace, but it, I think it, it, it enables us to be able to do more with, with, with less. And so that's really where we've started to hone our focus and, and what does that actually look like? And, you know, Kristen, you mentioned this earlier, the, the corpus of data that exists with inside of organizations like ours, even if that is not always in the format that we would once think was in heavily applicable to this. And so for us, it's, it's the outbound call um, and inbound call transcriptions and voice recordings because you can take these 
hundreds of thousands or in case of organizations probably your size because like millions of outbound phone calls and inbound phone calls transcribe those and they become a mass amount of data which is heavily applicable to large language models like we see with, with chat gpt which in turn we can then obviously tune through our own unique instances to start to understand okay what is the best way to engage with this particular type of consumer to drive a more complex sort of structured outcome or to deal with this more complex inbound dispute and so that's sort of the frontier that we're focused on we're calling it the ai collector and to build that we are looking at all of the existing data we have inbound and outbound across voice and across digital pouring that into our own models in our own private infrastructure fine tuning and training those models with unique indebted rated data coupling that with also um, learning QA and training data that we get in cooperation with our clients about how their products work and the best ways to use them, the best ways to reference them, and then see how those AI collectors potentially respond to those use cases. And so we, we've started to roll that out internally, similar to your suggestion, Chris, and we do that in a sandbox environment, human in the loop to start. Mm -hmm. And what's pretty fascinating to see is that, you know, first sort of glance, the AI collector is, I would say, as good as sort of 80 to 90% of someone who's gone through sort of four to eight weeks of onboarding training at Indebted. And this is the first version of the model that Mike and his team have, have rolled out. And so as you start to look at that sort of three to six months in the future, we essentially potentially have a workforce at the ready that can help and support our team scale. that can scale to hundreds of thousands or millions of inbound and outbound communications at once. I think that's, that's pretty fascinating. How do you think about the technology cost scaling with that? Like, technology costs, the more you process, right? At what point is it, is it always hmm. ROI positive or at some point is it so your technology costs are so expensive, you would want to hire more people? Yeah. So it, it's a great question. I think it actually, it's introduced the need to have a strong focus on the data engineering component yeah. um, of the business as well. And so just to give you an example, like, you know, I have the AI collector open on one of my, my tabs here and you know, looking at a test of where a customer came in and basically what they requested is, can you please change my email address, right? So you need to remove their, their current email from file and put a new email on there. And it goes through, the model has understood exactly what the person's reference has requested the action via our API internally, remove the email from their account. And that cost 83 cents. Now, the reason that's still proportionally higher, obviously not as high as having in a, a human do that activity for us, but is because of the amount of training data that also has to go in. And so I know this from, from speaking with, with Mike and, and some of the team is that how we structure the data engineering component is really important. If we have to send gigabytes of, of data every single time and crunch that through a third party service like an open AI, that's going to actually become pretty costly, particularly if you want to use the more front end cutting edge models like ChatGPT4. And so what you really need to look at there is how do you train those models internally? How do you want to manage the rollout and, and then the training of those models and obviously the compute required to bring down the fractional cost of actually answering one of those queries? Because even though 83 cents seems great, the reality is we probably can do that for three or four cents. Right. Um, and therefore the ROI is, is much more significant. I think that speaks again to like the types of people that you need in your organization. Like most agencies don't have a data engineer to work on that kind of a problem, right? Or they don't have an analyst workforce devoted to like cloud infrastructure setup and tiers of that cloud costs, right? I think that's like a whole different area of, of the business that might not exist for most agencies. Yeah, absolutely. And even something, you know, frankly, despite the fact that we do have a data engineering team and then also an engineering team and a data science team, and data analytics team, and we have all those sort of things that you, you would you would hope for, it's still to the point made referenced earlier, this stuff is moving so fast. And right. so, you know, within the space of a week, it's like, okay, do I want to test out, you know, Llama versus, you know, OpenAI's chat GPT, LLMs, and, you know, what is the right way to structure this? And, you know, which is the right tool to use and, you know, which database type of structures. And, and so things are moving so quickly that I also think that, yes, it's obviously a, a massive enablement to have those teams and functions, but I also think it's a, a reason to be very cautious of being sort of too complacent with the type of approach because some of the existing infrastructure used for more traditional machine learning 
doesn't really apply itself as well um, into some of the use cases here, particularly when you look at things like pinecone databases and tokenization and stuff, very different ways to look and structure and grab data. Um, and, and the need to be able to do that compute is, is very different. And so I think, you know, for our team, it's exciting because it's new things to, to do, um, but it, it is a whole new world to, to navigate. Awesome. I'm conscious yeah. of time. Um, focus on the QA side. Tim, I don't know if you want to jump into any other um, questions coming through. Um, yeah, it's, please uh, use the QA functionality to post any questions that you that you that you may have um, as it relates to that piece. Uh, Josh, I'll kick a question back to you because because we've seen so much change happen in a short period of, of of time, and you are first and foremost technology focused. Uh, this is in that it's not your first um, startup, and uh, so where do you sort of project seeing this? Uh, go and continue to go. And I know we're in a new era right now where anything's possible, uh, but what are you seeing kind of for the future and what does that look like to you? So I think we, my guess is that before the, the end of our fiscal year, which is, you know, you know, ends in middle of June because Australians do the fiscal year different to the calendar year for some reason. Uh, and, and given the goals that we set for indebted, um, I expect that we will have an AI collector that can do 85 to 90% of all the activity that an inbound or outbound agent can do within the space of the next nine months. And then I think that's going to really represent an opportunity to look at the hyper-personalization. And I think we as a business have done a great job of that on the digital space. Um, you know, messages are curated, channels are curated, content is curated. Um, in near real time for each individual consumer. But when we can really do that um, at a such a hyper-personalized level and, and in a two-way dialogue flow in near real time, I think that's going to unlock a whole new realm of possibilities in terms of collections performance and customer outcomes. Um, and the other one is I expect that we're going to see voice become a component of digital. I think but the, the reason we look at voice today as non-digital is because we always think that there's a human on the other end of the phone call. And the moment that becomes a piece of AI, I think you've got to stop calling voice like an analog channel. And you've got to start thinking of it the same way as we do with email and web chat, because we could handle 5 million inbound phone calls and have 5 million unique outcomes and get 5 million payments and have 5 million five-star reviews with the use of one piece of, of AI. And I think that that is going to change the entire outcome of what's possible. And that's going to have big implications on how we structure the organizations, particularly with inside of collections teams around having, you know, big digital strategy teams, big engineering functions, data science, data engineering, and, and everything related around, around AI as well. Yeah. So Kristen, you know, hearing that kind of stuff, what is, you know, especially around the personalization and being able to drive engagement, you know, um, what are you thinking about? I mean, that, that sounds like an ideal world to me. But, uh, yeah, it makes me super excited. I think there are untapped areas where we haven't really created that sort of experience for customers and collections before, right? Like uh, this is a this is an extreme, call it an extreme example, right? You might find that this person would really like their email to have a golden retriever in it. And then you can move that into a, a social chat, right? Just the seamless way that all of us are connecting hey, I expect that if I'm emailing my colleague, that if I move it into the Teams chat, they're going to know what I'm talking about that was in a different channel. And then I expect that if I was to take it, you know, I get in my car and I'm stopped at the stoplight and now I'm texting them, they know exactly what I'm talking about. And that is the future of what collections could be if we do have these hyper-personalized communications across all channels fully integrated. I do think that that also opens up some interesting compliance and regulatory areas, mm -hmm. right? So, hey, when everything is hyper-personalized, how do you make sure that you treat groups consistently, safely, that you're not disadvantaging one group over the other, even if it was never intentional, right? So now you have to have some additional oversight on top of that because you don't have the same letter template going out to everybody, right? Um, how do you create structures to monitor that um, and then report out to like your board or whoever um, on ensuring that you have the appropriate controls in place? I think that's another area of the organization that probably needs to shift and adapt. 
Yeah, I think you, you hit on a great point there because uh, one of the questions that came in is, you know, are you replacing all your collectors with auditors? Um, and uh, no, yeah. uh, I, I, but I do think you're going to have to have this specialization as it relates to compliance and oversight. So as we talk about your agents getting better and, and maybe more training the machine and a different skill set, compliance is going to have to do the same thing. The good news is there's a tremendous amount of reg tech that's out there that can help them they can help them do that stuff and looking for you know you know one of the one of the issues with some of the ai models is that there's maybe some bias that's already built in so how can you find that if there is how can you test for that and all those things and those tools uh exist in a lot of space already just because they're on the the, the front end the lending side where they've had mm -hmm. those concerns more so on the back end where we are on the debt collection side so yeah, absolutely. And I think, Tim, you know, the, to, to Mark's question, I do think that it, it will mean if we are able, let's say, for example, re, you know, the percentage of revenue that's spent on um, your collectors was the reference used there. I don't think we're going to replace every collector with an auditor, to your point, Tim. I think that would be a little bit overkill. But I do think we want to make investment in that area um, to, to drive some yeah, I think that some people think there's going to be this massive cost savings that's going to happen because you won't have to hire all these collectors. And to your point, Josh, you're going to be spending that money someplace else on the, you know, on the compliance side, potentially, which I'm a big fan of. We should be spending as much money as we possibly can in compliance. Um, but you're still going to have to, the data scientists, the engineering, the analytics, all of that, all of that kind of stuff, especially for right now. I do think we'll see some sort of commoditization. We already are some of the stuff that's off the shelf is as Kristen was talking about you know uh, aws is selling ai whatever that means for twelve thousand dollars a month uh, twelve thousand dollars a year so it's you know it, you can buy some ai but somebody has to know what to do with that kind of stuff so i think we'll we'll the, it's not like we're it's not like you're gonna have you may have five collectors bringing in five million in revenue right but you're still gonna have other expenses that you're gonna have to to ingest so it's not it, it'll it'll balance itself out over time somebody else asked in the chat if it was an it driven feature operations driven feature i i would advocate that those teams should work together um, sometimes when you let the it run the shop then you get a solution that is over engineered for what you need not always sometimes and then if you let operations run the shop sometimes you can't see that innovative future over here. So I really think those two teams should ideally be working closely together, sort of a strategic discussion to say, IT is like, hey, I wanna do this. Operations like, we don't need that. We could do this. And then you kind of come to meet in the middle to decide what the business priority should be, you know, revenue focused. That's my take. No, absolutely yeah, I, agree. I agree with you. And I think that the one thing that's going to be obviously different is the amount of decision making that can happen driven by data is going to increase. And I think that it's important to recognize for, for all the humans in the room to recognize that we're never going to be able to compute on so many data points at so many given points in time, as well as these you know, machines and mm -hmm. models and functions can. But it's our job to orchestrate and build those to then work across, as you said, Kristen, it's whether it's the strategy side of the IT or tech side, balanced across there with also the operational component as well but tim do you do you have any take on that no i absolutely agree i just um i was just going to take us to our last question just because we're we're coming up here on the end of time and it was and I'll, and I'll kick it over to 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 both of you but you know kristen you could kick us off what do you see the you know key distinctions between you know the human agents and the ai agents and is there some point where it's just there's a convergence if you will i I think it, given enough time, there's a convergence, honestly. I think now to, you know, to Josh's point, there's still a couple of milliseconds in between. Now there's maybe a little bit of hallucination, but if you're training it internally and you're optimizing that, I, th I think it gets really close. No, I don't, I don't, I don't know that I'm as bold as Josh to put a nine month timeline on when that is indistinguishable. Uh, <laughs> but I think it's, I My team's listening, so we have to keep to the target. <laughs> I, I think it is sooner than we would expect. Yeah, I don't know if that's a, a non-answer. That's a that's a great non-answer. You should be in, in the legal field. Yeah, it's coming. Noted. We don't know when, but it's it's definitely going to be here. Uh, I I just think I'm amazed by the 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 way the technology is moving and how, how quickly it is. I, I wake up every day and there's some 
we have an AI Slack channel and there's some new AI tool that's out there that's, you know, um, you know, the, the creating presentations was always one of my banes, you know, it was one of my pain points. And now it's, you know, there's a plugin for Canva in the chat GBT. And next thing you know, you've got, you know, the presentation is, and it's pretty, it's pretty good. Uh, and it's really good if it's me who's created it because I'll, I'm a lawyer. I just put words and dots. There's no pictures or animation or any of that stuff. So that's the stuff. <laughs> that's, that's the stuff that's exciting. But uh, I think we we're we're at time and maybe it's a little bit over. So yeah, awesome. Just quick thank you for everyone, um, Kristen, Tim. Thanks for joining us and thanks for everyone who uh, joined live and, and and for those who will watch. Uh, later and appreciate everyone also dealing with my uh, Wi-Fi issues <laughs> as we work through that as well. Absolutely. Thanks for AI. having me. Yeah, there'll be AI for so, that in the future, I'm sure. <laughs>